course, having said that, he's not going to today. Such is life. Is there a moment that you find yourself in where you are routinely at a complete loss for words? Like one person who talks to you or one question that comes up, right? You just hate it. It comes up. I have one of those moments where I'm at a complete loss for words, and it happens uh, when people find out I'm a pastor. There's a couple different responses I get. People say, oh, what church do you serve? We talk about church. That's great. Uh, people get a little bit cool towards me sometimes. Ah, they have a history there, and that, that's not the one where I'm at a loss for words. The one where I'm at a loss for words is when I tell someone I'm a pastor, and their response is to immediately launch into a story about some miracle that's happened in their lives. Right? They have been healed, they went in for the cancer, and it wasn't there. Or like they were driving down the road, and they were going to get in an accident, and, and then it didn't happen. And, and they get done like being really excited about this, uh, this miracle that's happened in their lives, and at the end of the story, I I, I'm never quite sure what to say. And you say, cool, I mean, that, that doesn't quite seem to capture, right? And it's not, I, I don't really have stories of, of my own like, like that to, to be able to respond back. And it's not that I don't believe them, right? If you tell me something has happened to you, I believe you, right? You tell me you've been, some miracles happened, I, yes! But what's next? Like, I, I don't know what words come next. I end up floundering. And it's that same sort of sense of floundering that, that I have as we read the, these, these particular scriptures today. We read about Jesus, uh, and he is responding to being asked to prove who he is. And so, um, at this one time, to prove who he is, he says, you know, I'm not going to do anything to prove. Go look at what I've already done. Look at the signs, the miracles, the teachings I've already done. Right? Another time when Jesus, that's in uh, John 10, another time when Jesus is... is uh, challenged like this, it's in Matthew 12, so people come to him and specifically say, I want to see a miracle. And he says, you know what, I, I'm not going to prove it to you. Right? I'm not going to give you a miracle just to make you feel better. Right? You're going to get the sign of Jonah at some point, but I'm not going to like do your miracle on commands. And, and so Jesus is kind of hard to pin down on what he's saying about miracles. He's obviously doing them. Right? But he doesn't send a, if you play a song, he doesn't just dance because you want him to. And then we move from uh, the time of the Gospels to the time of the disciples and Acts. We read about um, Peter and how Peter is summoned because a beautiful woman has died. Dorcas, this, uh, this lady who has, uh, means the gazelle, and she has served and loved people and made tunics for them and made clothing. And she's just a wonderful saint of the church. And she has died, and Peter is beckoned, and he goes up there. And I don't know if he's expecting to bring this woman to life. He was there when, Peter, when Jesus brings the daughter of Jairus back to life, back in Mark 5. But uh, we don't know what he's expecting. I knew this was a bad idea in the long run. Nope, you can't play with that. But uh, we don't know. And so he, he gets there, he prays, and he says to her, come, come back to life. And, and Tabitha arrives, and she does. And they walk out, and she is alive. And, and I, I'm sure that she was dead. Right? I mean, someone says they're dead. They, just because people lived 2,000 years ago doesn't mean they're any less or more smart than we are today. If they say she was dead, I'm fairly certain that she was dead. And so we go from the time of the Gospels where Jesus is working miracles but isn't going to do it on command. We go to the time of Acts where... Uh, Peter does basically do a miracle on command, and then we fast forward to today, right? We are, we're following Jesus today, and, um, well, I'm not going to do a miracle on command. Just in case you're wondering, I, I don't do miracles on command. I, I don't do miracles, period, really. I, you'd expect it of me. Uh, I do have the most pompous title in all of academia. My degree, I have a Master of Divinity, right? I am a Master of the Divine, and it feels like that should have echoes and like thunderstorms rolling in the background. Master of Divinity. I, it, you feel like when you get a Master of Divinity, you should get like one resurrection, four healings, and three discernments a year. Right? It feels like you should get some more, po some power behind that degree. I checked, I didn't. Um, but, uh, I, I, I joke about it, but uh, what's different between us and Peter, right? Why is Peter working miracles and, you know, I'm not, right? And so I'm, I'm, I'm floundering with this. I, I'm not sure what to think about this. So we're going to chew on miracles today. Um, how might we best understand it based upon miracles based on what we read in Scripture? We're going to look at... Um, 
and, and hopefully we're going to look at a way to maybe respond to the stories of miracles and experiences in our own lives that might be helpful. Right? This is the pondering today. This is definitively one of those sermons where I have personally been challenged and I'm trying to work something out and, and I will offer it to you and I hope it's useful for you, but this is really a sermon that was for me because I'm confused on this. So, so here we go. Right? We look at miracles in Scripture, and as far as I can tell, there are a couple different types of miracles. There are the miracles that are uh, restoring nature. Right? It is natural for that a person be able to see. And so when Jesus gives someone... Yes, that's your mom. Uh, when Jesus gives someone back their vision, uh, he, the person who gets their vision back does not suddenly get x-ray vision, do they? Right? When Jesus heals someone who is lame, that person does not all of a sudden gain the ability to jump tall buildings in a single bound. They can walk. Nature has been restored. It's the same type of feel that um, when Jesus turns water into wine, any of you could turn water into wine too. It would just take a little bit longer because you'd have to grow the grapevines, wouldn't you? Right? And so when Jesus turns water into wine, he's doing something very natural, just doing it a bit faster. There, so there are signs uh, that are sort of the restoration of nature, miracles of that type. Then there are the miracles that are more about just showing God's power. Right? When, when Elijah calls down fire to burn an ox entirely as an offering in the, comp in the sort of the competition between Elijah and the 450 priests of Baal, that's just God saying, here I am. Right? In the same way, the feeding of the 5,000 and the resurrection, these are signs of God's power and how God is. Right? When, when we're heading towards the kingdom of God, where if 5,000 people show up for dinner, you're going to have enough to feed them. Right? We're heading towards the kingdom of God where death does not have the final word. And so those are the two general types of miracles, right? The restoration of nature or showing and pointing down the road towards the kingdom of God. And I think that's what we, how we see uh, John talking about these. Uh, the Gospel of John doesn't call the things that Jesus does miracles. He calls them signs because they point somewhere. Like these are signs that point down the road to the kingdom of God. This is how life will be down the road. Right? And, and so that's how we understand the miracles from Scripture. How, how do we think about miracles today? Right? How do we respond to these stories uh, of, of miracles? I don't think there are any uh, simple answers about what, how do we think of miracles today. Be, and and I, I want to give you a, an example of how what we hear is, is changed by what we believe, right? If I tell you a story about a miracle, what you hear is predicated upon what you already believe. That's kind of an abstract thought. Let me give you a concrete example of what I'm talking about. Actually, it's more of a blacktop example. We just voted about blacktops in this county, didn't we? Blacktops and rock roads. We just vo voted about uh, maintaining the county roads. And it seems like a simple question, right? Should we vote a $1 tax per acre to maintain the county roads? And I'll tell you, as someone who owns no land in the county, I hear that in a certain way, right? Who here owns land in the county? Right? I am willing to bet a significant sum of money that when you heard that for the first time, you heard something very different than what I heard, right? Because I don't have any skin in this game. Yeah, a tax, $1 per acre? Is that a big deal? Well, it is a very big deal if you own land. You heard it very differently. And then you throw in the fact that uh, if you trust government to spend money wisely, then if you hear that the government would like more money to, to take care of a problem, you respond by going, yeah, well, they need, the problem needs to be solved. But if you don't trust the, money, the government to spend money wisely, you hear them asking for more money, and what do you think? Why should I give you more money to screw up with? Right? And so what you hear is based upon what you believe. If you're someone who doesn't trust the government has a lot of land, I'm fairly willing to bet that I know how you voted. And if you trust the government, and especially if you trust the government and don't own a lot of land, then you probably voted differently because you heard the question differently. You're coming back. Uh, and it's the same type of thing that happens with miracles, right? If uh, when people hear about miracles today, people hear things differently. When I hear someone 
talking about miracles, if I hear someone talk about how they've been healed or they've been directed or they've been guided by something has happened and God has worked in their lives, I believe that God is good and working in people's lives. So you tell me about a miracle, I'm going to say, great, right? But if you talk to someone, tell them the same story, and they do not believe that God is active, they don't believe God exists. Or they believe God is mean, or, or they believe differently than, than what a Christian believes. If they hear about something that is abnormal, right, they're going to hear that same story, and their response is going to be, well, that's random chance. Right? Worked out lucky for you, right? but they're not going to see God, they're going to see luck. Right? What you hear depends upon what you believe. I think this is what Jesus is getting at when he tells the story of Lazarus and the rich man. There are two Lazaruses in Scripture. This is not the one that Jesus brings back to life. This is the other one Jesus talks about in a parable. It's in Luke 15. When um, Jesus tells this story about this rich man who at his gate uh, was Lazarus, who was sick, and, and dogs would come up and just la lick his sores. He was just so pathetic and sad. And, he was, and so Lazarus and the rich man both die. And, and as Jesus puts it, Lazarus goes to the bosom of Abraham, and the rich, young, and the rich man goes to Hades. Right? And so the rich man asks for a drop of water, gets told, nope, and then he requests can I go to my father's house that I might tell my five brothers that they might understand and believe and change their ways? And the response in this story is, they had Moses and the prophets. If they were going to get it, they'd have gotten it already. Right? So it's another example of this. If these five brothers are yours, if they were going to understand who God is and how God wants them to act, they were going to get it from Moses and the prophets. And so if someone shows up from the dead to, to tell them this, they're just going to dismiss it. Like that, you know that moment in uh, Christmas Carol where Scrooge says, I don't believe in you, you're a, you're a bit of undigested mutton or a piece of cheese that didn't go down right? right? They're just going to laugh it off. You're, you're not real. Right? If, if they were going to believe, they were already going to have believed. Right? And so I don't, based upon this, the way that we, we understand based upon what we already believe, I don't think we can say miracles would ever be, can ever be the quick fix of faith. Right? It's not like if suddenly I began to be able to do miracles, which would be cool, it's not like everyone's going to flock and say, ah, oh, that's wonderful now. They'd be looking for the smoke and mirrors. Right? And if those who already believed they would see confirmation of what they believe, those who didn't believe would just find, would be looking for the hoax. Right? And so, people see um, miracles whether, based upon whether they already believe. What do we think about miracles? Right? What do we think about miracles? I, I think God is still active in the world, but I want to caution us against believing in miracles in, in a specific way that it's called the God of the gaps. Right? If, if a miracle... We, think of, we use the word miracle, and we tend to think of things that are big and unexplainable and flashy and large. And um, what it tends to get us thinking is that it, it can't be a miracle unless we can't explain it. Right? If we can explain it, that's not God. If we can't explain it, that is God. Right? You, you heard that? It's unexplainable. It must be God. It must be a miracle. And, and what ends up happening over time is our understanding of God gets smaller and smaller and smaller because every year we can explain more and more and more. The more that we can explain, the, God, the smaller God seems to get if we assume that the only thing God can do is that which we cannot explain. Right? <clears throat> I encountered this theory, this God of the gaps problem, when I was first uh, studying evolutionary biology. Because I, I believe that Genesis is true, that God created the world in an orderly fashion. Now, the fact that God created the world in an orderly fashion, and now we know a little bit about evolution, about a little bit more about how that, fa how that order took place, does that mean God didn't create the world? No, that means we understand just a little bit about how, well, the mechanism by which God created it. Right? The fact that God created the world out of nothing is wonderful. The fact that we can explain just a little bit about it when we talk about the quantum mechanical descriptions of the Big Bang, you know, that doesn't mean God's not amazing. That means we can understand just a little sliver of it. <clears throat> if you go back to the original scientists, there are two names... Um, that are associated with evolutionary biology. One is Darwin, everyone's here has heard of Darwin. The other one is Mendel. Has, who here has heard of Mendel? Right? A few folks. Right? Mendel is the dude who studied 
peas. He crossbred peas for years. And he's, Darwin said evolution exists. Mendel is the guy who like sat down and figured out the mechanics. How do you take short peas and tall peas and breed them together to get something else? He's the one who figured out for, uh, hybridization. And, and so Mendel is the guy who understood evolution for the first time. And he didn't do it because he just wanted to understand. He did it because he, wanted, he was a, a Catholic monk. And he wanted to be able to understand God's creation. He was a scientist who wanted to understand what God had created so that he could more fully glorify God. All the original scientists were priests and Catholic, I mean, Christians who wanted to study creation so that they could give glory to God for how God had worked. And so I don't think we can ever say that just because we understand it, that means God didn't do it. Just because we can start to understand it, that doesn't mean God didn't do it. That means that now we can appreciate some of the details of how God did it. So, those are the two things we can say about miracles, I think, today. That miracles will never be the quick fix for faith. That if you do a miracle, all of a sudden people are going to believe, because people will hear based upon what they already believe. And, and I think that we, we want to be wary of this God of the gaps uh, temptation to say, if I can explain it, it must be God, or it, it can't be God. No, if we can explain it, that means we can understand some of how God works. That doesn't really answer the, the last question we need to answer, though. How do we respond to the stories of miracles today? And, and to respond to that, I, I think I'm going to offer the most practical suggestion I can offer, which is maybe we need to be a little bit more like Terry Lynn Richardson. You all know Terry, right? She had a foot problem this year, didn't she? Right. As she put it, she didn't have a foot, she had a flipper. And uh, she uh, went down to Columbia so that she could get her flipper looked at. And she, she went down to the specialist for, for feet pro foot problems down there. And she showed up and she showed them her insurance, her insurance card. And um, they didn't take her insurance. And so she got a little bit angry, just a little bit, and uh, had a few words. And uh, there's one other specialist in Columbia who could do something about this. So she called. And um, she called the specialist in Columbia, and she was told, can you be here in a half hour? How many of you have ever called a specialist and been told, can you be here in a half hour? Uh, that, that just doesn't happen. So she goes there, she shows up in a half hour, shows them her uh, insurance card, and they love that insurance card. And, and the doctor comes in to chat with her, and the doctor looks at her and says, you know what, I've been on vacation. And I'm not supposed to be here today, but I felt like I just had to get back to the office today. I wasn't planning on it, but, but I thought I might come in. And so the doctor wasn't supposed to be there, is seeing her, and says, you know what, to, to get this fixed, to get this diagnosed, we're going to have to get an MRI done. And I'll go see what's the soonest we can schedule that MRI. Like, how long does it take to schedule an MRI? Right, when, what, if you, what do you expect? Right? At 1 o'clock that day. She goes in for her MRI at 1 o'clock that day, and she's laying in the tube of the MRI, and they turn on some gospel music so she can sing along and be kind of calm, because that's a very small tube. And uh, while she's laying there, she has this moment of peace that God is watching out for her. It's going to be fine, and she has not had any pain since that day. Right? And, and I found her, tell, she was telling me the story as she was bent down uh, scooping out um, meatballs for lunch for Thursday for the hot deli, right? And so, not something you'd expected her to do if you'd seen her a year ago. And, and what do you say to that? Well, when, when Terry Lynn has so much go right in one day that it's just so unexpected, do you say that's a miracle? What do you say? Hmm? I say God is good. Right? It's not flashy. I can explain every part of it. But I say that... God is good. I, I think of the other stories I've been told. I've been told stories. Um, there's a lady telling me about how she was laying on her couch just wrought with grief after the death of her son at Thousand Hill Lakes. Uh, he had died in a drowning accident in his early 20s. And, and uh, this woman was telling me that uh, just she did not know how she could continue with life. And she was laying there praying and she felt a peace spread across her like warm water. And from that day forward she had peace that her son was okay and she could continue with life. Is that a miracle? I don't know. God's good. Right? We hear these stories, and um, this, there's a story like this that's at the very, very beginning of the Methodist Church. John Wesley is walking down the road, and, and he is racked with doubt. He's not sure whether he's doing what he should be doing. He's walking down the street. It's uh, Aldersgate Street. 
Right? And he has this moment where he feels his heart strangely warmed, and he knows that God loves him, that he is forgiven, and Jesus has died for his sins. And from that moment, his life is transformed, and he charges forward with a, a certainty and a confidence in Jesus Christ. And the Methodist Church is born out of this certain, certainty and confidence. Is that a miracle? I don't know. God is good, though. I think that's what we can say today, because I think if we start, to, as we toss around the language of miracles, when I say miracle, people assume it has to be big and flashy and crazy. I think when I say God is good, I think we can say that. I think that sort of dodges the problem. Can you explain it? Can you not explain it? I, I don't know. What I can say is God is good. Thank God. Right? I remember walking through a field in college. Um, it was a dark field and a dark night. I have no clue why I was doing this. It was college. It made sense at the time. And uh, I'd been playing in a symphony earlier that day, and I, so I still had that music running through my head, Dvorak's New World Symphony. And I remember pausing and looking up at the dark, dark sky, moonless night, and seeing the stars twinkle and having that, this beautiful music running through my head. And I had this experience of knowing that was, there, was, there were things far greater than I would ever understand. I had this experience of something vaster than myself. And that's not the day I became a Christian, but that's the day I began looking. Right? Is that a miracle? I don't know. But I can tell that story and tell you that God is good. Maybe that's something we need to be sure to say a little bit more often. Be able to tell stories of our own lives and be able to, at the end, be able to say, you know, folks, that God is good.